interesting hallway conversation. May I cite you? So the thing I'm going to tell you about EFA sets me apart from all my REMS colleagues. And I can prove why I'm right. <laughs> you just have to understand matrix algebra. And so maybe that's what you could tell them. Hey, he Templin says if you understand matrix algebra, you can see what he's talking about. <laughs> but no, I wouldn't go there. Um, if you No, I'll try to explain it where my problem with EFA, there's two problems. One's philosophical. Why do you do an exploratory analysis on your data if you put your data together in the first place? Did you randomly put your items on a form to do a survey with? Or did you put them there for a reason? Right? Huh. Or how that goes. My pro the next problem with EFA is the solutions are very rarely stable for most data sets. Meaning if you do a bootstrap, I try to do, I actually tried to build an EFA homework in this class two years ago. And I, uh, I started just with one data set, I started bootstrapping it to see what happened. And it was almost like a uniform distribution of number of factors I should retain. Oh, that's bad. But the third problem is, is if you use a likelihood-based version of a factor analysis, the likelihood that you'd use is identical to the likelihood we're using today. Not today, last week. It's, not, it's ML, not REML. But the ML likelihood's the same whether you're using EFA or CFA. What you're arguing about is what it means to put constraints on your model to make it work. It's called identification constraints. So if you're in that ball game, the question becomes, OK, I have two versions of doing this. They both have the same likelihood. They're going to give me the same result. Which one do I want to use? The one that's usually more understandable. And that's what CFA is. This is zero versus I've got this constraint, the EFA constraint that I really throw up my, throw my hands out, like, oh my good, what is, they, they constrain the, uh, this crazy factor product of parts of your model to be equal to a diagonal matrix. Now, if you're thinking, oh, what the hell is that? I got to go look up what a diagonal matrix is and matrix product and all this stuff. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's the problem. In CFA, you say, that, that factor right there, or that item doesn't load on that factor. Zero. All done. All, all the way done. If you do that for both and use likelihood base, you can use Bayes or maximum likelihood. You get the same log likelihood. We saw in this class, same log likelihood, same number of parameters means same model. Question. What is your experience with There's not a lot of knowledge on that part by the reviewers, although CFA at least has a large following these days. I can't imagine what it was like 30 years ago, but, uh, but yeah, it's a typical thing. Most of the people who don't, uh, methods get built. The thing I'm talking about, by the way, this is this knowledge came about in the late 1960s. So it's nothing new, right? It's about 50 years old. Um, so you can start, start inside a long pattern of research, and then it depends on who the editor believes. But generally speaking, um, I've, I've included math. I've done whatever, and then they don't believe it. And the reviewers think I don't know what I'm talking about. So... Sometimes, but that happens with a lot of papers. The methods part's really interesting because you have a lot of people doing that. I actually had a discussion prior to class today uh, of a colleague who presented me some other colleague's EFA result and something else. I'm like it's screaming for a structural equation model, and here's why, right? So, but yes, it's it's sort of this odd thing where methods get developed to get them tested and then brought down into the classes where we use them in social and educational. There's a big lag, but then now there's even there's like brand new books coming out with old stuff in them, right? Like the more modern, multi, go look at the multivariate books that you're reading, that you can go find recent copies of, and you'll see Minova in it, and go watch this next week's lecture. So, so it's tough, but yeah. Generally speaking, you can, you can make the claims, you can cite them with papers, references, and so forth, and then who knows what's going to happen. But with math, the nice thing about math, though, is for this EFA thing, you can, you can show it. So, anyway. Okay, stop there. But yeah, if anybody hears that, Billy Skrepsky, friend and colleague.
likes, likes to talk about our differences in front of classes and stuff. So if you're in Billy's class and he says something about that, just be just seriously, just tell Billy, Templin says, if you knew matrix algebra, it's evident why he thinks the way he does. <laughs> in those words, he won't hold you accountable for that. But that'll just up the ante a little bit. <laughs> Some of you are in his class, right? Anyone going to tell him that? See what he does. Could you do that? Yeah, I like Billy. I used to like Billy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Liking him less by the day. No, I'm just messing around. No, I, I, do I mention him a lot in class still? I try not to. What? 906. Yeah, that's because you guys kept on feeding me lines from it. Like you would, they would, people would go to my structural equation modeling from that class right to his IRT, I think, right? Class last semester. So yeah, that was like prime feeding ground for it. But I tried to like, yeah, I don't need to talk about that. But yeah, if you could feed that line exactly like that. Templin says, if you knew matrix algebra, it's evident. It's, it becomes evident quickly why he believes what he does. Let's see if he turns red. Better yet, if you can one of you video while the other one's doing that and help me. That'd be awesome. All right. Now, uh, the, the person who really um, who really fights me over that is John Poggio. But uh, what are you going to do, right? So your advisor, right? Yeah, you could go tell him to the same thing too. <laughs> All right, I'll stop there. I'm ripping my colleagues now. No, I'm not ripping them. It's just a healthy scholarly debate. But seriously, though, right? Why would you put? Why would you be like? I have no idea how my items got here. How many factors do I have? Right? That's what Ania Faye is basically telling you. Let's go with. I'm getting, getting, getting up, getting, getting. Uh, whew, foreshadowing the fun that's going to come. We'll have a party. We'll have a death to EFA party. I think we'll call it that. Wait, actually, I'll invite Billy. That's it. When he comes, why don't, we, why don't why we have an argument? I'm going to have a debate in class. That would be, and that's the other thing. If you could take him to this message, I invite him to come to class. <laughs> and I'll re return the visit in his, where it's his class as well. And we can do this. What do you think? Have a debate, like a scholarly debate. Why do you think it's right? Oh. All right. Okay. Fun times. <laughs> We're, we got a homework here. Is anyone stressing out about the homework? Oh, please. Let's deep breath. Okay, everybody just breathe in. Hold it. Let it go. It's going to be okay, right? This really should be the. I, I'm, I forgot to mention when I took off homework six, you're getting nine points for it, too. So it's like, not if your grade is going to be affected badly, right? You're, <laughs> What, is that bad? No, I'm just trying to re relieve the stress. You're not going to get a bad grade in this class. All right? Promise. <laughs> if you feel like you're going to have a hard time getting it by the deadline, we got to talk. But if you're going to, you know, let's, we, everything's on the table. I'm trying to be very, uh, I understand you're going through a lot as a student. I do. I've been there before. I want you to learn the most things I can teach you but not overwhelm you, right? Okay, now, let's go forward. Um, let's add some predictors to this model, shall we? To do that, I'm just gonna copy everything I did before with model one, change stuff to model two. Now, the, one of the big differences in what we're doing with mixed models compared to what we're doing with uh, the path analysis software is that in mixed model software, we end up having to um, not put in the variables that aren't in the model. One thing you might have noticed when we looked at the output, here's my output, the log likelihood was 393.514. Now, I'm not someone who memorizes log likelihoods, but I can tell you, because I made the mistake on home, your last homework when I was testing it, that your, do you remember what your first log likelihood for homework four was? 419, I thought it was in the sevens or eights, right? Negative seven, negative eight, something like that. 
So had you not put in the dependent variables before with the zeros in front of them, your log likelihood would be on the order of this. Now they would not be identical because we're using REML and that is a different scale of the likelihood function than what ML is. Right? REML causes good things to happen for variances, bad things to happen for likelihood ratio tests. Right? So, um, but this is the nice thing about it. This part of the software is we don't have to add these variables outside the model to put them in the likelihood to make a likelihood ratio test work. The bad news is we can't make a likelihood ratio test work. Oh. Okay. Getting into that. Why? Let's let's go through this. We want to now add to model, go to model two. Model two is, by the way, I fixed the text. This gives you the options you're supposed to set on the GLS function. Right here. You can literally copy and paste in the single quote marks, I didn't end it with a single quote, but to the period. I know, seriously. The interaction of me and this system is just a bad combo. Um, okay, so you copy and paste that in, but we need to add a model where we uh, add instruction type to the, the, the model one. You with me? Okay, so here's model one. We knew from before, here's the names of our data. Before we added crepe class, and sure enough, we need to add that thing again because the instructions say to add, let pancake instruction be the reference group. Now we're gonna have a reference variable and a reference group. So you might be tempted to say, okay, let's grab crepe class and put that in the analysis. Ta-da, should be done, right? It's not, because this puts in one predictor for crepe class, regardless of which DV it's being predicted. So then we need to not only add crepe class, we need to add the interaction of crepe class with crepe. And this term right here will go and give us the difference in the effect of crepe class across the DVs. Yes, Ryan. Model two. This is model two, yes. Ah, eh, shoot. All right. Put this down here. All right. Yeah, I fail. I, I certainly fail to be perfect, which is why Billy might think he can get me on EFA. <laughs> Invite him to my class. We will have a duel. <laughs> well, I think it would be fun, right? An academic duel, right? Without the whole gun death angle, right? We're both going to live, and I'd, I'd like to be at least cordial with him, even if his popularity in my eyes is... <sighs> you like EFA? We can't be friends. No, that's not true. Uh, that's not true at all. Um, okay. Model 2, GLS. Does this make sense for Model 2? Okay. Run this here. Now we run, look at our output... And now we have four betas. We want to try a hand in what these are. Actually, before we get there, the first question is usually what? Which model fits better, model one or model two? You'd be tempted to do what we've done in class all along, ANOVA. But look what ANOVA tells us. Warning, shouldn't say warning, should be like error. Fitted objects with different fixed effects. Remel comparisons are not meaningful. Right? And yet it still does it. It's like it can't control itself. <laughs> oh, sure, here you go. Here's some garbage. <laughs> right? Like that's, uh, anyway, sorry. I want one that comes back and it's like, and you try it a second time, it's like, no, you didn't hear me the first time, go back, right? Anyway, um, why are these comparisons not meaningful? Did I mention that online? You remember? I will describe it to you. So if our likelihood is based on residuals, what do you think changes between model one and model two? The residuals. 
Because when we put different fixed effects in, we have put different predicted values for each person, which means the residuals now change, which means the likelihood functions do not apply, are not on the same scale. They're in, it's different data now that goes into them. That's sort of the, I'm sure that you could poke holes in that from a really theoretical statistician's argument, but that's the conceptual right. Yeah. Would Kevin. it still be possible No. AIC and BIC are also out. Anything, and the reason why AIC and BIC are out is because they depend on the log likelihood. So, what do we do? What's that? I'm looking for a good example. Sarcasm's good. Quit? Yeah, let's quit. Grab a beer. Let's go. Um, let's see. It is, uh, it is something where we're going to, I'm going to show you the multivariate version of what you see on one single line here. Do you remember the name of this test that I've been calling it all semester? Wald test, right. And it's, it's Wald-ish because it's a t-value. True Wald has a z statistic there, but let's not split it. I don't want to split hairs too much. Wald test, we'll call it that. There is a multivariate analog of the Wald test where you can test more than one beta at a time. Wouldn't that be cool? Am I right? Is that cool? Does that sound like something we should use here? The, the test of hypothesis works just like you would expect it to. The null hypothesis is all the betas you've added are equal to zero. The alternative is at least one's not. P-value works the same. That's the same null and alternative that you'd use in the, uh, the likelihood ratio test. The difference is we're using what's called a Wald test, which is valid for this analysis, compared to a likelihood ratio. About and now, now you might be asking yourself because everybody wants our editors want to argue with me and journal reviewers and Billy. <laughs> it's pretty lonely over on my side, my camp. It's okay, I can handle it. Um, is that cheating? Isn't that isn't that bad? We can't do that, right? And the funny thing about that is, if we could do a likelihood ratio test, the Wald test and the likelihood ratio tests are what we call asymptotically equivalent. Meaning if our data were super, super large, we'd, you, they would come to the same conclusion. So yes, for a finite sample, we have a problem. But at the same time with a likelihood ratio test for a finite sample, we may have a problem. This is the best evidence we can do to figure out which model works together. In other programs, such as SAS, there is a, something called a contrast statement that does this. But this is the analog of what we do when we have multiple degrees of freedom. If you remember the F test, the degrees of freedom numerator, talked about like the number of groups. It's the number of betas that go into it. This is a multi-degree of freedom numerator test that we're doing here. So how do we form it? Sure enough, GLHT, back at it again. We need to go and create some new effects in GLHT to figure this out. And sure enough, starting where we had it before, now the next thing we need to do is actually have a few more zeros here, right? So I'm just going to copy this, actually copy this part right here. And for right now, I'm going to call this I'm just call this. I'm just going to name them what they are in the output. I'm going to make it an exercise for you to figure out what it actually means. Okay. So here. Now we we create our GLHT function. We have to have four different betas. One for well, four of these different values, one for each of the betas in the model. And so that means we just put a zero in each spot and a one with respect to each specific beta. Do you see how I did that? So each one of these is just giving us the beta back. It's sort of a, not a very um, intellectually demanding exercise. We would expect to see the, the beta that goes in is the beta that comes back. But why we're going to do that is because we take the two values that we have that are new and we roll that into a single test in GLHT. 
So how do we do that? We can do, yeah, where did my mouse go? Come on, Templin. Uh, we use that rbind statement. And in rbind, we put the names of the new betas. So that put, builds them into a single, single model matrix right here. This is our effect matrix. There's a one for beta three and a one for beta four there. And then we can do the GLHT function. Again, I can just embed it right here in a summary statement. This is model two. The lin FCT is effect. And at the end of this, we can actually do the following. We put the word test. And if we add this chi, chi square chi sq test and open and close parenthesis right there at the end, it's going to do the work for us. Preferably, we want that to be an f test. The difference between chi square and f is that chi square's degrees of freedom are f's degrees of freedom for the numerator, and the denominator degrees of freedom kind of depend on sample size and dependency in the data. So this is sort of the true multivariate wall. Unfortunately, GLHT is not tricked out enough to do that for us yet. Another thing on my wish list, or better yet, how about I just code it? Anyway, next time, right? So if I do that, I know, seriously, get with it. This is what I get. This linear hypothesis right there, those estimates, what you'll note, the first thing that pops out, these estimates should match the new beta weights. And sure enough, negative, two, two, negative 0 0.223, 3.58, and that's 3.58. So those are the two betas it's testing. And at the bottom it says global test. It should say degrees of freedom that are equal to the number of lines that you have in this linear hypothesis. There should be two. And here is your p-value. That indicates at least one of those is not equal to zero. Yes, Maggie? If that's the case, it probably means this rbind statement didn't get all the way put in. Um, but then again, let's see. If I did the wrong effect here, if I just did this effect one, it says, does it say like this, this, this statement right here? Yeah. Take a look at your rbind. And if that doesn't work, if you get an error with this, then go take a look at these two lines above it that are going into it. Good question. So questions on this. What this does, I'll talk, but please raise your hand if you have questions. What this is doing is literally going in, like the, the, these lines that are highlighted on the screen right now are literally there just to highlight the two betas that we added to the model, the two new coefficients. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and, it, and with those being highlighted, with those two beta coefficients, then we, we put them into a single, this GLHT function, and it gives us a hypothesis test for both of them simultaneously. Yeah, no, false alarm. Other, any thoughts, questions? We could have, by the way, done this for, mac, for the maximum likelihood version two, but I was just trying to get you used to the idea of multivariate models first. So I was trying to limit the number of cognitive demands that, for an already complex set of things to do. So questions, thoughts, comments? You got this? So the, the idea then of, of looking at this test is the same. If, if it is significant, then they are significant. That's right. If this test is significant, it means at least one of those betas is not zero. And if that beta is not zero, that's the impl or implying that the model that it has the beta in it is needed, is the one that's preferred, right? Because it's not zero. Model one, it's technically that beta is zero in model one. In model two, it's not. So therefore, if this is significant, one of those is not, not zero, so therefore we need model two. It's sort of a chain of logic with that. Other thoughts or questions? So that's, that's the analog. So we, instead of on those questions in the homework that said to do the likelihood ratio test and do the test statistic, that won't be, it will not say likelihood ratio test. I made sure to change those this time. 
Instead, it'll say a multivariate Wald test. Multivariate Wald test test statistic is still a chi-square. It's right there. Multivariate Wald test degrees of freedom, right there. Right? Same degrees of freedom as what you should have seen in your likelihood ratio test. Different, um, different number and different configuration where it's showing up. Cool? Maybe? Okay. The concept, though. This is our model comparison tool now. When we're using uh, residual maximum likelihood, this is how we test model comparisons if we're doing to do nested models. I'm sure there is, uh, probably because we get what we pay for with R. I don't, I, I haven't double checked it with SAS. Um, okay, well, no, I just, I put in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so did I. Did that end in a big round? Uh, let me see here, hang on. I didn't want to add this trouble, so it was a good reason. Seriously, you guys are going to make me cry? I am serious. Hang on, watch this. I do thing equals thing. Sorry, just troubleshooting homework now. Test SSH 123 there. Yeah, that should be it. SSH 11. I don't know why it should be wrong, unless the model is off somehow. It should give you two. Uh, should, I have I have two decimal places. So. Anyway, send me an email. <laughs> when I when I sober up, I will uh, <laughs> I will reply to you. Ah! So you get frustrated and stressed about the homework result, and that same frustration and stress is me about what's going to go wrong with the homework. Maddening. Anyway. Huh. What did you put in? A thing. So uh, if you if you create an object that's the result of the summary function, you can uh, you get access to all the stuff. This is saved under SSH, a test in SSH for whatever reason, and it should be one one. And that's how I've got it in my homework system. In fact, there Actually, it, it, yeah, off or something. Ah, <laughs> I, I have like I have one fifteen point five. But when I did this, it's 115.45. Yeah, that's why I Okay. Hey, everybody, heads up. If you get to question three, yeah. question, and then the other question is what, 13, 12, something like that? Yeah. And you're getting a round, there's a rounding error BS that shows up. Because <laughs> it's giving you one digit on the summary statistic. If you do this, save the summary as an output. And this is one of my generic names I have, thing. It's one of my more, I usually use a swear word, something or other, some four-letter word. And at the end of it, it's test and SSH. Dollar sign test, dollar sign SSH. You get all the digits you need. So... So if, so if you have errors on problem 3 or 13, pardon me, 14. 14, 3 or 14, come to this part of the second video for this class and look at my screen. That's how you fix it. Alternatively, pick two-digit two numbers above or below, or two, two decimal numbers above or below that result. Because it's rounding to two decimal places. And wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know, the summary for this rounds it to one. And this is why I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, I gotta, I gotta like, I need, we all need a vacation. Yeah. And homework six is dead. So it's gone. Okay. Apart from the technical glitches, you want to get into the hard part of the work? What does this mean? We found out that model one fits worse than Model 2, so we want to stick with Model 2 now. Let's interpret some Model 2 results then. Hooray. Okay. 
What is the intercept? What does that represent? Now, before I actually get you to answer this, think in your head, it's the same intercept you've no known and love all class, and then and that'll help you with the interpretation. Right? The intercept is the predicted value when all the predictors are equal to zero. Now add the conditions. What does that mean for all the predictors to be zero? And now I'll ask you, what does the intercept represent? Pancake ratings for someone who was in the pancake class, exactly. This is what we would expect pancake ratings to be for someone in the pancake class. Thank you, Ryan. And dare I say, Ryan, you look like one of the more stressed out people in the class, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just totally, I'm, just, I'm like, I was, I, that was like bad, that's totally a joke. I meant, I haven't actually been watching Ryan, I, and I don't know who's stressed out here. It was more just, I was trying to like make a joke. I apologize. You look, you look happy as normal. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? What, oh, that's right. Kevin was the scapegoat. Oh, sorry. Ryan, I apologize. Kevin. No, sorry. Kevin, why don't you answer for us what this crepe thing means? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Before we get there, I'm not calling on you. Let me set it up first, and you're welcome to if you want to. But remember, before, if this were just your straight univariate linear regression, you'd start looking at this and you'd say, hey, it's a slope or a main effect. And I'd always ask you, is it a simple main effect? Or is it conditional on something? Or is it, you know, is it, I'm sorry, is it a simple main effect, meaning conditional on zero? Or is it unconditional, meaning it applies to everyone? Which is my coded linear model way of asking, is it part of an interaction? Yes. So this is the main effect. It's, it's called a simple, or uh, simple main effect, which means this value is conditional on the interacting variable being zero. So now, what does this main effect represent? Anybody? Kevin. Yeah. The, the difference of the crate rating from the pancake rating for people who were instructed in making pancakes. Bingo. Exactly. Did you hear that? Should we do that again? OK. Very good. Um, the main effect. We know that because this is crepe, this is the difference between the crepe rating and the pancake rating. But it's conditional on crepe class being zero. And when crepe class is zero, it's someone who was trained in pancakes. So this is the difference in, the, in crepes ratings versus pancake ratings for someone in the pancake class. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. While we're doing this, here's a survival tip that I use, including actually in the homework itself. Okay? Use GLHT to code this as if it were coming directly out of Levon. Because the numbers that would come directly out of Levon, right, the beta for pancakes. You know, the crepe rating, or sorry, the crepe class beta for the pancake rating line and the crepe class beta for the crepe rating line, you can get those from the, the sums of different parameters, just like we just did. So, I'm going to go and take my, my GLHT things. I'm going to paste, copy and paste them again. And here, I'm going to call this beta zero, but this is beta zero for pancake rating, right? From the from pancake class, something like that. That makes sense. And we know that's just the intercept. That was what we had described it as. Ryan told us that before. Thanks to it's partially thanks to the espresso fueled by fueled by espresso. No, what's that? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> that's good. <laughs> good to hear. So that's over here, right? Okay. I didn't know that you could get that at the, uh, whatever this is called. <laughs> wow, the places that story could go. Uh, <laughs> so now, what is uh, the, the, the last term that we just found? 
we said that the value of crepe represented the difference in, pan in pancake and crepe ratings for someone in pancake or in the crepe class, right? Sorry, in the pancake. Difference between pancake and crepe rating for someone in the pancake class. Okay. So now, what we really want to have is beta zero for crepe ratings for someone in the pancake class, right? And that is going to be given by the sum of beta zero plus beta one, right? Because if that is the difference between the pancake and the crepe rating, that adding them together gives you the crepe rating, gives you back, gives you around the the uh, the uh, reference thing. Gosh, I'm blanking on things. Okay, with me? All right. Next, who wants to tackle crepe class? As I always set it up. First thing to ask: Is it a conditional main effect or unconditional? Conditional. It's a simple main effect. Conditional on crepe being zero. Who wants to interpret this? Ah, you want me to? Okay. It's the difference between people who are trained in crepes versus people, oh sorry, it's the difference in pancake rating for people who were trained in crepes versus people who were trained in pancakes. Right? So why is that the case? It's the difference in pancake rating because crepe equals zero. And because this is a, a zero one coded variable, that is for the crepe class, right? Basically saying the difference between people trained in crepes versus people trained in pancakes. So now with that knowledge, I'm going to go back to my syntax. And for my pancake rating line, I'm going to copy and paste what I had before. This is pancake rating for people in the crepe class. And if I want to figure out what that happens to be, I can put a one in right there because the sum of those tells me the mean of that group. The mean for people in the crepe class, right? Let me just back up. If the difference in ratings, uh, in, sorry, for pancakes, between people trained in crepes versus not is negative 0.22, we know then that the intercept, which was people trained in pancakes, uh, plus this should give us the mean for people trained in crepes. Right? Okay. And actually, this effect, if I'm going to go with what comes out of Levon, this effect would be the same, right? Because the Levon effect would be identical to what you have for the reference variable. Why is that the case? Because there's still an intercept for each dv in Levon, right? So let me let me go through, show you what this is. Let's let's go with the last one, and I'll show you what this is, and I'll try to talk through it a little bit more. The last one now. What is that? Boy. Well, this is where we have to interpret that interaction already. And that interaction is, we could look at it as, the difference, if we, if, we, uh, if we go with crepe, right here. Crepe, we represented the main effect. This is for people, uh, this is the crepe rating of people who are trained in pancakes, right? And this, would be the difference between um, the crepe rating for people who are trained in crepes versus people who are trained in pancakes. <laughs> exactly. So let's go and try to put this into a code that we can at least appreciate. 
what would be the crepe class rating for someone who is in, uh, sorry, what would be the crepe rating for someone in the crepe class? This is where this gets interesting. To do this, let's take a look. What is the crepe? So for crepe rating, we need uh, crepe and crepe, and we need crepe class. So it, it should be a one here, zero there, and a one here. Let me just double check that this is correct. The um, Sorry, I'm blanking on this for you right now. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So if I put all these together and I go and grab my GLHT again, let's put these numbers in, make, make sense of these numbers real quick here. And then I'll try to describe it better. As you can tell, I'm already getting confused by this, and I'm talking about this, and I've done this for a number of years, probably too many. I should retire. So you can imagine this is this is complicated stuff is what I'm trying to tell you. I find this the highest degree of difficulty. Actually, I do not want this last one right here. I do not want this chi-square test. Let's see if this makes sense. So let's go with what we know before. We knew that when looking at our output, we knew that people who had um, made pancakes and been trained in pancakes, this was the mean, right? 7.03. And then we saw that for people who had made crepes but who were trained in pancakes, it would be this thing plus that thing, right? So those together should give us this value right here, 0.32. So those are the two means. I'm fairly confident in those. Next, if we were to talk about the impact of crepe class for those who make pancakes, it'd be 0.22 right here. Yep. And if we were to talk about the impact for crepe class, this is where I went wrong. The impact of crepe class for someone who made crepes Would be what? Well, we now have um, crepe class right here, uh, and plus this. So actually, whoop, uh oh, uh oh, everybody takes a big deep breath. I hope it's okay. Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Cutting the tension. That that just makes like this even worse is to see that. So. Okay. So the crepe class effect should be the crepe class beta that was for pancakes plus the difference between it, which is right here. And so I put the one in the wrong spot, I believe. But, uh, one right here. So putting this together, this is what I have right here. So this is telling us for someone who is... Um, or someone who is trained in pancakes, we saw this before. Someone who's trained in pancakes, there we go. Let's back up. What is the crepe rating for someone trained in pancakes? It would be someone trained in pancakes, intercept plus this main effect, right? What is the crepe rating for some what is the some what is the crepe rating for someone who's trained in crepes? It would be the sum of all of these, right? So the difference between that would be the effect that we would have gotten out of Levon, right? So sum of all of these, which would leave us just these two behind, right? So here, let's... Blah, blah, blah. Excuse me. <sighs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That was my mother, by the way. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Anybody knows my mom? She likes EFA, too. <laughs> All right. Let's just try to break this up a little bit. All right. This is mean 
of crepe ratings for pancake class, right? This is mean of pancake ratings for crepe class, right? Now, where did I get those other numbers from? And why are those the effects that come out of Levon? To find those, let's find the mean. Did I get that right? This is pancake class. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. So this is the, the, the first one was the mean of the pancake ratings for pancake class. The second was the mean of the crepe ratings for, crepe, for the pancake class. Let's go and build. What's the mean of the crepe ratings for the crepe class? Right? Right, so I'll call this means CRCC, and of course it's going to be, we all agreed, the sum of all four of these things, right? One there and one there. And so if I do this right here, so, here's where we're going. This third linear effect was the mean of crepe ratings for the pancake class. This fourth one was the mean of crepe ratings. Pardon me. This is the mean of crepe ratings for the... Back up. Mean of crepe ratings for the pancake class. This is mean of crepe ratings for the crepe class. So the effect that comes out of Levon does not give you the mean. Remember, there's a reference group there, right? Because it was like your typical linear model. And that reference group was the difference between these two effects, these two means. And that's why this last term right here is what would come out of Levon. It's the difference in means between the crepe rating for the crepe class minus the crepe rating for the pancake class. Start, start to make sense? So I'm trying to reconstruct Levon and not doing the best job, but this is where this is going. The same thing could have been found for the other ratings. Here we had the mean of pancake ratings for the pancake class. What is the mean Ratings <laughs> for crepe class. What is the mean pancake ratings for crepe class? Well, that would be mean PR, PC, or CC. And we talked about that before. It would be the sum of the intercept, which is the mean for pancakes, plus the main effect for crepes. So let's back up. Well, let's go back to our model again. What is the mean? What are the betas that go into that mean? Well, we want someone who's being rated on pancakes, but who is in the crepe class. So in this case, the crepe variable would be zero for pancake ratings. The crepe class would be one. So the mean for this would be this intercept plus this crepe class main effect. Here, here, this is a one and a one right here. And now, yes, question? No, oh, sorry, not to me. My problem for not looking, I'm looking at a screen that's not mine while typing on one and blah, blah, blah. Here we go. Blah, 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 my kid says. I know you're up against the break. We're going to take it in just a moment. That second one right here. This is the mean. So the first one, again, was the mean pancake rating for people in the pancake class. This is the mean pancake rating for people in the crepe class. So if you were in Levon again, we would see that the difference between the two would be the, the effect that we got out of that linear model because it's the reference group is pancake class, right? And so it would be the difference between these two, which gives us negative 0.2231 which is what we would have seen in Levon. I. 
So while you're thinking about that and persisting, let's take a 10 minute break. And yeah, quick question. Yes, how about I just show that right now? My apologies. There we go. And take 10 minutes, come back about a couple minutes after 3.30, or yeah, 3.30, and we'll talk some more, okay? Thank you. And yes, I'm open for questions during this break.